It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, my co-host, the one and only Andreas Grabner. Andy, <laughs> I was going to call you uh, Andreas Grimer, but, you know, I figured <laughs> that was last week recording. So, yeah. how you yeah, doing? Not too bad, actually. Um, it's the first time in months that I'm not working from either my kitchen or from the Dynatrace office in Linz, where I've been to maybe four times now in September. But today I'm actually in Vienna. It's kind of like my first trip in uh, in COVID times. So very interesting. In a hotel room, like the old days, yeah. recording a podcast. Wow. Oh, wow. That's wow. And when you say Vienna, besides thinking of, you know, some of the foods and stuff and all I think of Vienna Calling which was I forget who did that Falco? one that was, song. Yeah. was did Falco do Vienna Calling that was his too of course yeah yeah yeah, oh, yeah who else it was either Falco or, or, or Mozart one of the two right uh, <laughs> <laughs> and is there really much of a difference between Falco and Mozart really when you think about their genius um, <laughs> anyhow we got colder weather coming in let's talk about the weather now it's nice it's it's cooling off here uh, it's just so awesome I love I love falls and springs in Denver um, we get nice, cool evenings, warm days. So it's just really, uh, the mood has changed from the oppressive heat to just some, some, some nice welcome weather. So, uh, I'm not traveling. I'm not in fancy Vienna. I'm not in a hotel room, but I am at least enjoying some of the outside a little bit this week and last. So that's where I'm yeah. at, Andy. Yeah. We're, we're not here to, people don't really care how I feel, right? They might care about you. Um, well, but I think well, they I think, care more about the topics, think, right? Ex exactly. And and maybe as we've been talking about the weather, I wonder, asking Sebastian, how the weather in Hamburg is these days. Yeah, the weather's great. So um, typically, I mean, stereotype, Hamburg is rainy. Uh, but uh, the last days and today, um, uh, sun is shining. Um, so really enjoying the weather. And uh, unfortunately, not in a hotel, or luckily not in a hotel, uh, uh, working from home currently, uh, and uh, yeah, the weather is really nice, uh, especially for Hamburg uh, at that time in the year. You know, yeah. I'd be really remiss, I'd be really uh, shirking my duties if I didn't point out that there is a kind of a cookie called a Vienna finger, the dessert, and then Hamburg, obviously you have hamburgers. Uh, there's nothing really Denver, so I'm the only non-food, and it kind of shows because the food here is pretty bad, but I just had to point that out. And Hamburg! I... I I think that's awesome that you're there because being a big Beatles fan, you know, that's where they got their start. Freaking yeah, legendary yeah, exactly. city, you know? So that's some place I hope to visit it someday. And yeah, Andy, take over, please. Yeah. Shut hey, me up. Seb yeah, Sebastian. So uh, come in like one more punt on Hamburg. Hamburg, obviously, for those people that have never been, have a big harbor, a lot of ships, a lot of containers being moved around on a day-to-day -day basis. You're so clever, have, Andy. You're so clever. So, <laughs> now, I just got this, I just got this idea by listening into Sebastian's uh, previous podcast that he actually did with the Kubernetes podcast with Google, uh, where you were invited to actually talk about, uh, a company that you run, you are, you know, CEO of Kubernetes, and uh, I thought it was interesting because these two guys, uh, Craig and Adam, they they did a little. Or you you told them a little story with uh, being a port a city, and then uh, I think you had uh, an, an event, a webinar, and people, and you you announced containers, and then was it a container company that actually ships physical containers? They registered, and you were wondering if they know that this is a software webinar and not a container webinar. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we, uh, like uh, five years ago, uh, when we started the company, uh, we started a conference called Container Days. And so we will start uh, promoting it. And uh, one of the tickets we sold uh, was sold to a, a container shipping company. And we were like, oh shit, uh, did they really understand uh, <laughs> the purpose of the conference and it's software container and not real containers? And so we called them and explained, hey, look, um, potentially, uh, 
the conference is something different what you expect and as i said no no uh, we are from the it department of the company and we are really looking into it containers and we said well oh, good uh, <laughs> uh was was quite interesting and uh i mean another funny story about uh, hamburg so uh, uh yeah uh, i'm ceo of uh Kubernetes, uh, but formerly we were, we were called uh, Luzi. Uh, and the, th why we choose the name was really like, uh, I mean, we all know Docker. Uh, we know um, uh, Kubernetes, a uh, of a ship. And so we were thinking, okay, we are from Hamburg. Uh, we know containers, real containers, at least quite good. Um, so let's stick to the pattern. And uh, uh, Luze is a lower German word for a navigation pilot of a ship, which comes like at the end uh, when you go into the haver. And we said, okay, that's meta, uh, that's pattern matching well. And so we said, okay, let's go with this name. That's pretty cool. It, it's great that we, it, it's kind of, we all find our Nordic names for, not naughty, Nordic names for things that are related to Kubernetes. Uh, Sebastian, not sure if you know, but uh, we've also launched a, an open source project in the Kubernetes space, in the CNCF space, and we call it Captain because we kind of uh, want to steer the containers in safely into the next harbor, which we believe is production. So that's why, um, in case you want to read up on what we are doing, uh, we also used the German, the German phonetic version of a captain, so K E P T N. But back yeah. to you, Sebastian. Uh, the uh, the way we actually got introduced, uh, I was actually invited to speak at one of your meetups that you run, the Kubernetes online meetup. And I think you have meetups uh, around a, a, at least Germany and I think around Europe and maybe even around the world. And so we actually got to talk. And then I thought, wow, this is really interesting what these guys are doing and especially the experience that you have in, in helping organizations uh, automate Kubernetes uh, and, 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 and operate Kubernetes. But instead of maybe coming from my words, uh, maybe you can give a quick uh, introduction on which problems you have actually seen out there as organizations move to Kubernetes and, and what problems you are solving with your company. Um, yeah, so when we started, like uh, I started really early with like Docker 0 0.5, something around. Uh, um, and uh, so we really started working with Docker and Kubernetes, oh, it's five years ago, uh, something around that, uh, even more. Uh, so really early on, on the journey. And so we used it first for, for some uh, own ex uh, experiments and um, we said, hey, that's really interesting. We want to do something with it. And then we started the company. And uh, what, what we see so quite early is like Kubernetes is not easy. Um, it's uh, It makes a lot of things easier. Uh, but in general, the system, it's a distributed system. It's a quite complex system. And how everything uh, works uh, together uh, is quite challenging. And so... Um, what we saw was like, hey, how can we help customers to really adapt this new uh, modern ideas about cloud native and how to uh, use cloud native to uh, to build new modern products, but also how they could potentially move existing workloads to Kubernetes and um, yeah, using us with our experts there to enable them um, on the one side with uh, trainings and consultings, but on the other side, also we built a product, uh, uh, Kubernetes, which helps customers to really managing Kubernetes cluster across different cloud providers on-prem. Because what we saw from the beginning, like one of the biggest challenge was how can I spin up Kubernetes cluster? Um, at that time, the only cloud provider managed service which was available was GKE. Um, and it was easy, you press a button, but we wanted to have the similar experience on mostly all providers. And so we came up with the, with the idea, can we build something like this? Um, uh, and we came up with the idea, can we leveraging the operator pattern to manage this? And so uh, our goal is really, how can we help and enable customers to uh, use cloud native and uh, moving into the cloud native world? Mm -hmm. um, and now you bring up, I need to bring up another conversation I just had early today because he said, you know, from the outside, Kubernetes looks like this cool, very easy to use and operate thing, platform. But then if you take a closer look at it, and especially you have done this for the last couple of years, you see how complex it is. Now, I, Brian and I, we both have a colleague who has been heavily, uh, you know, invested in uh, in PCF, in Cloud Foundry over the years. And and I just have to quote him because he just mentioned this to me today. He said, uh, he said, I don't understand why 
Kubernetes is so popular because it feels like we're making a step five years back uh, as compared to the to the experience that some people had with with PCF as a very opinionated um, you know platform. And and uh, I obviously read he I think he. He, he may is not yet as deep in Kubernetes as he is with with PCF, so I'm I'm pretty sure Kubernetes these days uh, is is much easier to handle, especially with services and tools that you offer. But do you kind of agree with it that that kind of um, you know it, it 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 took a while for Kubernetes to really uh, became more you know developer friendly, end user friendly, operations friendly. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, first at the beginning, Kubernetes was quite limited in functionality. Uh, uh, you only had at that time, yeah, you had pods and uh, replica uh, set. No, not replica, replica controller. Um, uh, they were even not like stateful applications. Now, but on the other side, now as more and more functionality is coming inside of Kubernetes itself. Um, uh, but also, if you're looking into the CNCF landscape. Uh, it gets more and more, uh, uh, yeah, there are so many projects out to figure out uh, what are the right components I want to use. And um, I think what I think what, what your colleague is, is mentioning, like uh, Cloud Foundry is really like a quite opinionated way how to do this. And there's only like one way. With Kubernetes, there are a lot of ways. Uh, of course, we have the common ground to say, okay, we have the Kubernetes API and that is, is standardized. But on top of this, uh, there are a lot of capabilities. And I think it will be also interesting to see where this goes in the next uh, years, um, what workloads uh, will end on Kubernetes. Uh, and um, But I think now on Kubernetes, you already have much more cap uh, capabilities and possibilities, but typically this brings also uh, a lot of more complexity uh, in this game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, especially as I think you, you, you pointed it right out there, it is there's uh, so many different ways of doing things in Kubernetes, Kubernetes and, do, and achieving one thing where in other platforms there might have just been one opinionated way, which made it very easy to do and felt very good, but then uh, it obviously limits you to that opinion. Um, in, in what what we see uh, is uh, more and more organizations obviously want to move on Kubernetes because I think it's clear Kubernetes is one uh, or it kind of is the popular platform for for container based systems. Um, now, do you see working with your organizations with your customers are people uh, still or primarily moving existing applications on Kubernetes and just trying to find a different platform to run this on? Or uh, do we actually see more and more organizations actually really building applications the cloud native way to really leverage the power of these platforms? What we are seeing is, is mostly, especially when people are starting, uh, especially in the early days, it was more like, okay, we want to build a new modern architecture and not like directly migrating existing stuff, especially, hey, we want to build microservice architecture. Uh, let's build this completely containerized and run this on Kubernetes. But then the next step was like, okay, uh, let's also move existing workloads on top of Kubernetes. Um, and I think um, still most of the workload was currently going on Kubernetes is still like uh, own um build uh custom software which the customer wrote on their own or with some uh agency uh, wrote for them uh, i think one of the big moves was currently still uh not happening but i think that will come in the future will like that that vendor software will run more and more on kubernetes so that uh different applications are built from the scratch for running on kubernetes and you have complete uh certified kubernetes on uh, on this uh certified solution to run it on Kubernetes instead of running it uh, on, on v VMs. And I think that is one of the next steps, what I think will happen, uh, especially that customers are also pushing uh, the vendors to uh, provide them a way how they can run this on Kubernetes. Um, but yeah, then I think what a lot of customers try to do is really with Kubernetes standardizing their operation um, uh, for new applications, but also uh, that it helps to um, move legacy applications so that they in the future can potentially have uh, one platform uh, which can run all the workloads they have. Mm -hmm. 
And and I know this is you know, obviously a tough question to answer, but but do you think that is this a future state that we will achieve in the next two years, five years, ten years? How long do you think it will take until we actually really see also legacy? So what, let's say when do we when we will see will we see a uh, a Kubernetes platform that runs all the workloads? I think it's. I mean, when all the workloads uh, will move, uh, I think that will take some time. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it will definitely take five to 10 years uh, that a lot of workloads is, is migrating. But what we see now, and uh, we did already, uh, a survey uh, to uh, our container days participants, but also to customers. And because we wanted to figure out how far are they in their cloud native journey. Mm -hmm. And we see now that first customers, um, have adapted Kubernetes, have done first things into production, and now really start migrating more and more workloads uh, to Kubernetes. And I think in the next two to three years, we will see a lot more workloads moving to cloud native and Kubernetes. Um, and also then, I guess, um, also more uh, legacy or existing application will move to Kubernetes. Which doesn't every time mean that it's like, um, the same application will move to Kubernetes. It could also mean uh, that uh, the application will be uh, rewritten or new architectured to move, uh, run in, in the future on a in a cloud native way. Mm -hmm. um, now, as you said, if, if more and more people are moving over to Kubernetes, and, and obviously we we see this with the people we work with, with the with the organizations that are our customers, also within our organization, uh, we are building more and more stuff on Kubernetes. Um, they, I think questions come up is uh, for what, what are the boundaries of an individual Kubernetes cluster? Do you need a cluster for a certain environment, for a certain set of software, for, um, I don't know, for, a, for a, I mean, the question is really what's, what, what, what belongs into one into one cluster versus where do you need different clusters? What are the boundaries? And also, uh, who is responsible for these clusters? Because eventually, if you have a large organization that is building software and you have, let's say, a thousand applications um, and a thousand application development teams, do they all own and run and manage their own Kubernetes clusters in their dev, in their pre-prod and in their prod environments? Um, or is there going to be, um, a, like the traditional operations team or platform team that is then providing these things as a service, but they manage everything. Do you have some insights in, 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 in what large organizations are doing and especially how they're organizing and, and how they're organizing their clusters and who owns them and who is responsible for it? Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's exactly. Uh, where everything started with, with our company. So uh, we strongly believe in that you need to manage a lot of Kubernetes cluster across multiple providers uh, uh, in the cloud, on-prem. And uh, the one thing Kubernetes is not really uh, good is really multi-tenancy. So multi-tenancy in a way that it's really hard multi-tenancy. Of course, you have like namespace and uh, airbag capabilities there and you can do some stuff, but it has quite fast some limitations and i think um, every organization need to think about how they want to manage this uh, sometimes it could be uh, cut it based on applications sometimes it, it's more like based on their organization so uh, different teams uh, have their own cluster um, but i think the we what you really need is also like a container as a service uh, operation team or a team which can really help uh, inside of the organization to operate all this Kubernetes cluster and uh, to manage all this uh, Kubernetes cluster um, and also ensure that the operation of these clusters are or, or that how these clusters are rolled out are secure and um, in a way that is compliant with the organization and that not every developer needs to figure out how do I um, uh, provide specific policies I mean, similar what we did in the past with like uh, databases, not every developer um, is running their own databases. So we either using managed services from the cloud provider or mm -hmm. we have a database team inside of the organization who are taking care about this. And I think similar can be applied to a general Kubernetes platform uh, architecture um, so that you want to have a team who's taking care in general uh, about the Kubernetes cluster. But then 
uh, that the developer are API driven and having the capability to easily spin up and manage their uh, Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I think I, I guess I, I concur with you on this. I, I guess it makes sense, right? Because in the end, it's just uh, another service that you want to consume because it should not be the core responsibility or the core, um, uh, I'm not sure what the right uh, the English term now is, the core competency of developers to also figure all of these things out. So there has to be uh, either, if, if you go with a cloud provider that provides the whole thing as a service, then they're taking care of it. Uh, or if you do it within the organization, you have a part of the organization that provides that container platform as a service and making sure that the things like security, uh, policies, governance, that this is all taken care of. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think you, you said exactly the word. Um, you want to provide this as a service uh, and either you cons consume the service from an external provider, which could be uh, a cloud provider or like an outsourcing provider, or internally uh, you want to provide this as a service to your own organization. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know we... I guess I have to come back to it. We see a lot of people that, that you know, are moving to Kubernetes and a lot of people have already played around with it somehow. Just talked with, with folks this week. Uh, they have in the magnitude of, you know, a thousand plus Kubernetes clusters running in their environment and managing them. Um, I, I don't know what additional, let's say, management layer they use on top of it, but from a scale perspective and you must see a lot of organizations running kubernetes do you see what's what's kind of the spread from you know organizations that are running 10 100 clusters a thousand clusters at ten thousand clusters is there is there is there kind of like the size of the enterprise if typically tells you how many kubernetes clusters they will have or is it more like how their software architecture looks like how their how their organizational structure looks like do you have any 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 thoughts and ideas on on how enterprises typically end up with um, like in, in terms of number of clusters and how they manage them? Um, yeah, so I think it really depends how far are they on their cloud native journey. Um, so if they are more in the beginning, uh, they run potentially a few clusters. Uh, uh, two, three, five, up to ten. Um, if they are already like, especially if it's a bigger organization. Um, and they really have this service idea and really having the capability to provide this to their organization. Uh, I think it scales quite fast up so that they run 20, 50, hundreds uh, uh, of clusters. Uh, what we see, especially uh, uh, w when you look into like uh, the edge, uh, uh, that you easily come up uh, with use cases uh, and rollouts where they're talking about a uh, thousand uh, or 10,000 of clusters. Uh, which needs to be managed. Mm -hmm. Could you could you quickly define for me Edge? So what are these use cases? What, what type of apps are running and where? Uh, I think uh, for the Edge, there are different use cases. Uh, one is like, uh, for example, uh, you have uh, a factory and uh, or you have a few big data centers, but you also want to run stuff inside of your factory with Kubernetes. Uh, so uh, you need to deploy Kubernetes in the factory. Another edge use case would be also um, uh, uh, if you have supermarkets and you want to run in each of the supermarkets a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, mm -hmm. So you need to run a lot of clusters uh, there. Uh, and I think also up to uh, running individual uh, devices on, um, uh, for example, trucks or uh, in uh, inside of specific machines, uh, even like uh, with like Raspberry Pis, uh, this kind of stuff, so that you leveraging containers um, and uh, the API of Kubernetes to to manage your software and uh, lifecycle management of your application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember also one use case from one of our customers. They run, funny enough, uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, on their uh, cruise ships, so they have data like floating data centers, basically, right? Because they run all, all of their obviously software that manages everything on on that boat, um, and and their platform of choice is Kubernetes. That's also kind of funny. I mean, obviously these days it's a little bit challenging for them. Hopefully they will bounce back after the after this pandemic is over. But uh, I thought that's an interesting use case. Um, we need to get a we need to get a shipping company. <laughs> exactly. Like using it. <laughs> yeah. 
putting a data putting a data center into a container and then putting the <laughs> container onto a ship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Be a literal container. Containers and literal containers. Yeah. <laughs> and um, then you have to get captain. Exactly, because you need a, you need somebody that steers it into the right port, making sure that everything is. That, we that'll be a new right requirement port. to be able, that'll be a new requirement to be able to captain a ship. You'll have to know captain. Uh, that's and, and then you need a load uh, for the last uh, miles yeah. uh, so to get yeah. you in the uh, <laughs> in the harbor. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Sebastian, I hope it's okay that I fire off these questions because I really this is just fascinating having somebody like you on the other side, and I can just do this. I hope you're still you're still good with more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, I, 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 yeah. Um, so the the other thing. Um, uh, now, now I need a pause. I just lost my train of thought. I think that's what it called. What's what it's called? Brian, this will be the first time when you need to cut me out. No, uh, so don't don't do it. Don't cut me out. This is just it should be on record. It took me a while. I lost my train of thought, but now I'm back. So if if um, what what we've been i remember i did a lot of talks uh, over the years you know both brian and i are performance uh, engineers and we we saw a lot of things that people just did wrong it's like why when you build an application uh, do you make a thousand database statements if you can do it with a single call um why are you so why are you allocating memory in that way which shouldn't be done and then lead into large garbage collection now i assume there's something like this as well with the organizations that you work with that maybe start with Kubernetes in a certain way and then they see, you know, it's not scaling, it doesn't work for them, it's slow, they're they are frustrated, they need something new to manage and then probably you come in and then you see maybe what organizations have done wrong from the beginning. So my question is, if something like this is true for your, the way you see the IT world in, in, in the Kubernetes space, what are I don't know, two or three things that you see people are doing wrong from the beginning so we can give our listeners a little bit of advice on um, when they're going down the Kubernetes train and they want to eventually scale this across the enterprise, what do they need to figure out from the beginning? What do they need to do right? Yeah, I think one of the uh, interesting facts is uh, now everyone is saying, okay, I do cloud native, I do uh, Kubernetes and uh, I sometimes have the feeling they expect now all the IT problems are solved with this and even not uh, question themselves if potentially Kubernetes is the right uh, choice for it or does it still make sense to run the application inside of a, a VM uh, potentially because the application is not uh, scalable or is not there and uh, uh, so really think first, okay, what are what are my problems and then think about what are the solutions I'm using and not starting with like, uh, okay, this is my solution and where are my problems? Uh, so uh, really having the idea what really can Kubernetes gain me an, uh, on benefits mm -hmm. um, so that you can really leverage this. And then I think the next thing is also if I using Kubernetes really think about what is my architecture? Um, is my application really already built for this kind of uh, uh, architecture? or potentially what I need to change on my application itself, that it's really scalable and uh, can uh, Kubernetes can provide me uh, the um, uh, scalability and expectations uh, what I have initially thought about. Uh, uh, that's what we see uh, quite a lot, that, that people throwing the existing application on top of Kubernetes and uh, that even the application cannot do, for example, rolling up, uh, upgrades or cannot run HA. And so when they uh, do an upgrade, um, uh, the, uh, it goes down and they have an outage. Uh, and they say, yeah, but I'm running it on Kubernetes. Uh, yes, uh, but it's your application uh, it's not capable to do this and uh, it's not Kubernetes. You first need to re-architecture and think uh, what needs to be changed on the application and then you can leveraging this uh, scalability from Kubernetes that uh, it can do rolling update or it scale, scale up when uh, you get more workloads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's, that, that's great advice. So kind of don't, don't prematurely pick Kubernetes just because you think it solves all of your problem. It's like... Uh, uh, I think the the analogy that we often use is right. If if you if you get a hammer, everything becomes a nail. Uh, but that might not be the problem that you need to solve. And then the other thing is with uh, with your apps. I remember uh, the same example. Uh, one of the 
people that I talk with, they lifted and shifted one of their Java enterprise apps to Kubernetes. They basically, you know, packed a four gigabyte memory heavy WebSphere application server into a container and deployed it on Kubernetes. And then we said, that's great. Now let's scale it up. Well, they said, well, let's, let's roll over to the next version. And then say, well, this takes about an hour or half an hour because uh, of the, 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 the way the JVM was sized. And then we said, well, then you will never be able to reap any of the benefits of Kubernetes. It just becomes an additional layer of complexity that you don't want. Um, uh, exactly. I mean, that, that's exactly a good use case. Or probably we see like uh, putting your existing application and uh, the application needs like uh, 5, 10, 20 minutes to really warm up and to get right. ready. Um, and so... To really then scale it, uh, yeah, uh, if you have peak tra traffic, uh, for example, uh, the traffic is already gone uh, until your application is, is ready. And also like rolling updates is, is, is quite slowly because if you have already three replicas and takes 20 minutes, you need one hour to roll it really out to all the uh, application. And uh, I think that's really, uh, you first need to think about, is it really there? Can I use this? Um, or, um, or have the understanding to say, okay, I know I have some drawbacks in my architecture. I'm doing already the move to Kubernetes, but I cannot expect more out of this. Uh, and now I'm I'm running it on Kubernetes, but in the same time, I'm now starting re-architecturing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully we will have, hopefully the people are listening in and that are thinking about moving to Kubernetes really think, think, think this through and then do that due diligence and do the research on the apps that they're moving because uh, just because you are moving on Kubernetes doesn't mean, as you said, it, not all of your problems go away. The, uh, the other question that I have, so now obviously you founded your, your company and I think I listened, uh, I heard this in the podcast, you, you really tried to listen to people that you worked with, organizations that you worked with and where they, they ran into challenges and then really, you know, around that build a product uh, that actually solves problems. Can you uh, explain a little bit for people that have never heard about uh, Kubernetes and, and kind of the, the type of problems you solve with your solution? Um, what are the biggest things you're actually solving? Um, because people may have never heard about that a tool like yours exists and there might also be others in the market. So we want to be open here right um that there might be other solutions out there but i think we want to hear from you now what are the what are the key things you're solving when it comes to to operating and managing large scale numbers of clusters yeah so when we started um uh, uh, the company uh, four and a half years ago it was we saw a pattern with, with, with our customers so they wanted to have a cluster then they want to have of course upgrades of the clusters and Uh, some of them wanted to already have multiple cluster and uh, some of them also wanted to have like already as a service. So want to provide the developer in best case, a UI uh, or API where the developers can spawn up uh, the clusters. And uh, at that time, the only solution uh, where you get this out of the box was uh, Google with GKE. Mm -hmm. And so we were thinking, Uh, yeah, we like the service, but we want to have it uh, uh, anywhere. And so we came up with the idea, can't we really build a solution which can help to manage uh, tens or even hundreds or thousands of clusters uh, across different cloud providers, uh, also uh, on-prem uh, and now more and more also at the edge in a scalable uh, way. And this is uh, what we started then, really uh, building an application, how you can manage Kubernetes clusters, uh, uh, and which was really focusing also on day two operation, not like spinning up only the cluster. Uh, how can I keep the cluster up and running, uh, that everything is automated, that we do automatically backups uh, of the clusters uh, if something is happened that I can recover. And that in best case, I can run a lot of Kubernetes clusters with really less amount of uh, manual work or people involved so that you can really run this in an automated way. Because especially if you're now thinking about uh, you want to run uh, thousands or tens thousands of clusters at the edge uh, where, where not e easily can go and uh, send a, an engineer to, uh, mm -hmm. this really needs to be fully automated. And uh, so that's what, what we are really believing also um, if you think about enterprises, uh, you want to roll out uh, some kind of yeah 
corporate blueprint where you say, okay, a production cluster needs to have like a specific set of requirements. Uh, for example, potentially you don't want to export uh, services on HTTP. It should be encrypted and uh, HTTPS, or you don't want to run a uh, privileged container so that you can really force policies in the, uh, in the cluster. And then, um, uh, you know, okay, all my clusters have at least a, a specific set of uh requirements which is uh, which it is fulfilling um and, and that's what we're doing with our uh, uh kubernetes platform uh to provide this uh solution and uh, on the other side uh, what what we also built is cube one where you can really manage individual clusters so uh, we had this so kubernetes was built that it's it's built as an operator and it's running completely on kubernetes uh, mm-hmm. and so we had every time this chicken egg problem we need an underlying kubernetes cluster and so we said okay we have mostly all the solutions out uh, or we have mostly all the components what we need to run also single clusters. And then we started cube one to really managing uh, individual clusters so that you can easily spin up a cluster, uh, manage a cluster and um, yeah, also having another tool to do this uh, where uh, you have less complexity, uh, but in an easier way to manage this and operate this. Mm-hmm. So, so this, if, if I understand the architecture, right, that means when you are, when you are managing or launching a new cluster, you use an operator to then deploy your management piece of it that is then uh, making sure that the right things are then really getting rolled out. Um, as you said, maybe even launching a cluster from a template or I'm not sure what you called it earlier, but um, making, th- making sure it's properly configured. And then obviously this component is then you know communicating back to a central Kubernetes platform that is then managing and taking care of, of all the different clusters that, where the where the where the operator runs. Is this do I understand this correctly? Yeah, exactly. Um, so because what we were thinking, uh, like when we started uh, building the application, we were thinking, okay, what what is the best way to manage Kubernetes? Uh, and we came up with the idea: can't we managing Kubernetes uh, in a cloud native way with Kubernetes? Mm-hmm. And so at that time like third party resource and order custom resource definition uh, were not available but we we had the idea uh, this reconciling and this controller mechanism uh, from kubernetes are working quite well can't we copy this over and use this also to to manage our own stuff and um uh, yeah we, we tried around and it was working um and so we said hey that's uh, a great way to manage this uh, because with this we can we on our own already uh, can using purely Kubernetes um, and can leveraging all the technologies Kubernetes brings us out of the box to manage itself Kubernetes cluster. And so with this, um, we had from the beginning on a, a really good foundation for the architecture because now we easily can scale this uh, because it only depends on the underlying cluster. Uh, and then we can scale this up to a lot of Kubernetes cluster. And what we also do is like, instead of running the Kubernetes control plane, SVMs, uh, we decided we want to run them containerized on top of a Kubernetes cluster so that in case of errors or something is breaking, it's running in a pod and uh, Kubernetes takes care and it's restarting the components uh, automatically without that we bu- need to build additional logic around this. Mm. So your control plane runs on Kubernetes and then obviously you leveraged all the benefits of Kubernetes if you're actually building and architecturing the software the cloud native way. That's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's that's fantastic. I looked at, um, I'm looking at your website right now, and there's just one thing that intrigues me a little bit, I got to say. Um, it's uh, DevOps automation. Um, because the reason why it just, you know, brings in, uh, jumps into my eyes is because I've been, I've been talking a lot about uh, DevOps over the last couple of years. I think obviously it's a big term and a lot of, People maybe mean different things uh, with it, but never you also talk, never know it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me Google this for you, Mister Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I just, I just wonder, just out of curiosity, um, is this where you are integrating? Where is is your story that when you're rolling out, when when you're integrating with with existing CI/CD solutions? That through your API, you make sure that the target clusters, the target environments are there so the, these tools can deploy into these, into these clusters? Or do you also actually have some type of continuous delivery solutions as part of Kubernetes? Of Kubernetes? 
Um, so our story is really that uh, we want to provide a standardized API, which existing solutions can, can use. Um, and I think what we are seeing also um, is that we want to enable developer in the future also to create more clusters to, um, uh, for example, and throw them away uh, so that you uh, think about new patterns and uh, instead of um, having a, a staging uh, a cluster, mm -hmm. uh, potentially create a cluster per each run, spinning up, deploy the components, and after the run, uh, you destroy it. And uh, everything is going in a quite fast way so that you every time really can start from scratch. Um, but also uh, on, on parallel, potentially, you want to have a staging environment where you can test the existing upgrades, but that you can do both. Or if you need to do a load test or something like this that you quickly can spin up a new environment, deploy everything on top of this. And uh, then uh, you do the load test and afterwards you throw everything away and it don't takes you uh, days to, to get everything together and sort it out uh, to do so. And so our goal here is really uh, what we're providing is uh, the openness and uh, access of uh, uh, upstream Kubernetes API and then having an API to manage the cluster so that you can provision these clusters, mm -hmm. uh, which is mostly based on a uh, cluster API uh, from Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. This sounds like we definitely should also talk uh, around integrating this with our open source project, Captain, because Captain is an events-driven um, control plane where we are orchestrating a delivery process for progressive delivery and also for automating operations. So, and the way we do it, we then integrate with other tools to do a particular job along that process. So, if your process is delivery, then the first step is typically provision the environment, make sure the environment is there, then deploy the app in there, then run the tests, and then we do the evaluation of the test. And I can see that uh, an integration through with your API would be great to make sure before we deploy that the environment is there. Uh, that we can then deploy it. And in case we won't need to run tests and, and massive tests, let's say that where we could even provision the clusters for the testing tool. We talked about load testing earlier. So sometimes these tests obviously then need dedicated uh, environments. So that would actually be really cool. So um, we definitely need to have a follow-up conversation on that. Yeah, we definitely should look into uh, how an integration could look like. Uh, I mean, Kubernetes is also open source. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we could think about how we could combine uh, both this uh, to to really gain these benefits. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, Sebastian, is there... I know this was now kind of me asking, firing off a lot of questions. Hopefully, it, it all kind of made sense and there was not too many stupid questions in there. But is there anything that we missed? Is there anything that you want to make sure people people know about Kubernetes, people know about uh, Kubernetes, people need to know about problems that you're solving? Um, yeah, I think one project we didn't talk about is uh, Cube Carrier, uh, which is our new open source project. Um, so what we're seeing now is like, um, yeah, a lot of companies now know, okay, they need to manage Kubernetes clusters and they are, there's our solution, but also a lot of other solutions out there. Uh, but one of the next challenges, uh, what, what we think uh, are coming up more and more is like, how can I manage the workloads across all these clusters, especially also with this operator pattern, which is now coming up more and more. And when we think about, uh, we want to run uh, 1,000 clusters and potentially per cluster, I want to run 10 uh, applications, so I need to manage ten thousand applications. Uh, in um, in most cases, it's then like uh, cloud, hybrid cloud, on-prem, uh, potentially at the edge. And uh, what we really believe in there is like, okay, the next level would be like, how can we help customers to manage this complexity? Because this is what we believe is like really needs to be also heavily automated. Uh, because otherwise, uh, this whole uh, workload will not really uh, uh, work and um, uh, we also really think about we need to think also there more in this idea of providing services so that different teams uh, can provide uh, a team can provide database as a service another team can provide monitoring as a service so that it gets easily consumable and uh, not every 
area needs to figure out on its own how to plug everything together. And that's exactly where we started building uh, Cube Carrier so that we can help customers to deploy and manage these workloads across different uh, environments uh, in a scale uh, in a scalable way uh, that you can, for example, have a database in the future, have a database cluster, have an application cluster, and that potentially you even could connect them. Mm -hmm. How do you spell Cube Carrier? Oh, I found it. Cube Carrier. Okay. Perfect. We want to make sure that we also put yeah, these yeah. things into the proceedings. Yeah, exactly. You find it uh, when you go to github.com slash kubematic. Uh, there you find all of our open source projects. Very cool. Um, Brian. Yes. Brian. I'm, I'm just sitting still there? here. Oh, I just muted my... I, I was on mute and then I unmuted. I was, <laughs> I was muted. I was unmuted, then I muted. I was opposite. <laughs> yeah. Um, now I've just been sitting here um, stewing over all of this. So Sebastian, as you could probably tell, there is I'm on the show because I'm the engineer, and Andy's the brains on the show. But I um no, <laughs> I I'm, I'm absorbing all this, and I, and I think a lot has really become much more solidified, clear. You know, one of the Andy, one of the themes that we hear quite often. Um, when we're talking to various people is whether it's you're looking to move to microservices or functionless, you know, serverless functions or moving to Kubernetes or whatever. The idea is you don't do it unless you have a reason, right? It, it shouldn't be that, Hey, I'm an organization. Kubernetes is hot. We need to move to Kubernetes or microservices are hot. We need to move to microservices first thing is always the idea of evaluating, like, why do we need to move to that? What's it going to give us? And I think today's conversation really helped me understand just even conceptually, like obviously Kubernetes is to me, it's pretty obvious conceptually, but it really helped frame it in another way. You know, it's not that Kubernetes makes things easy because far from it, Kubernetes is very complicated, right? You're, you're managing all of your ingresses, egresses, your network connections, all these different little things going on in it. You still have a humongous role for the what would be the the sysadmins, but what Kubernetes is doing is giving you flexibility to use more modern architecture, right? It's going to be hard to run microservices on bare metal or even virtual machines, right? So if you're moving to these more modern deployment things, Kubernetes makes sense. But you know why I was overwhelmed listening today is that if you're just running bare Kubernetes it's still going to be overwhelming. You still need a lot of, you know, what, for lack of better words, sysadmins. I know a lot of them like to call themselves DevOps admins, but the people running that system who know the system and knows this have to be done, uh, whether it's not, whether or not it's done programmatically, you know, I guess most of it in Kubernetes is, but it's, it's really just to me, at least I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say Kubernetes is your new data center model, right? It could have been on bare metal before, could have been on VMware now. Now you're running it on, on, on Kubernetes, which is probably running on one of those two anyway. Uh, but that's the next thing that you have to manage. And I think it's really great that, um, you know, Kubematic is coming in and taking a lot of that hard work out of it. Because I also see a parallel, Andy, between, you know, I, I see running, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sebastian, too. Uh, I see running Kubematic or running Kubernetes on your own versus leveraging the help of, like Qmatic, is the same or similar to when it comes to monitoring using a well-established APM tool like Dynatrace or doing the open source, we're going to do it ourselves, right? There's a lot, if you're going to do it yourselves, you can, but there's a lot of work and there's there are people out there who are figuring out the management layer the of this piece to, to help you out, to make something like Kubernetes easier to use um, because it just, yeah, it's just, it just really seems that it can be there. There's the, the mistake of, I see someone like a CTO somewhere says, we're going to move to Kubernetes. And everyone's like, yay. And then they move and they're like, holy crap, we need to hire four more people. We all need to train up on this and that, you know, and it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. So um, I think this today's episode really just helps solidify that to be, unless I completely missed it. <laughs> Did I get it right? At least. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I think 
Uh, we can also see this with like uh, uh, Linux itself, like yeah. uh, potentially in the beginning, uh, uh, you build your own uh, Linux distribution. Uh, but nowadays, um, I think most of us are not trying to build our own distribution. Right. Uh, we're using existing tooling, um, either completely uh, open source distributions or uh, uh, you want to have uh, vendor support for, for it. Uh, and I think similar patterns applies also for cloud native. And but I think what's also important is, um, I think in the, in the whole discussion about cloud native, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the tooling is one component uh, of this. Uh, I think what people often forget is like, uh, you need to change your processes. Yeah. Um, uh, if you try to run Kubernetes in the same way as you do it before, um, it will not work, uh, at least not well. And also, uh, you need to train your your people, and uh, because it requires completely uh, new skills. So, um, uh, Kubernetes can only really be, or cloud native can only be really successful if you also touching uh, the other both components, processes, and uh, your your employees and your people uh, to get them on this new journey. Because otherwise. Uh, I think the chance is high that it will fail. Yeah. It seems like, you know, some, uh, I would think that some people might think Kubernetes is sort of the easy button, but it, it seems that it's not, you know, the easy button is move all of your software to SaaS vendors, right? But then you're completely restricted to only what they can do. It's not a real solution. I mean, for some things it is right. I mean, if you're going to do, if you're a smaller shop and you want to um, set up a, a, a commerce store, there are plenty of commerce SaaS products out there that are going to be great. But if you're, you know, if you're aiming to be the next Amazon or something, you're going to have to build your own, right? You're going to have to do that. So um, uh, obviously the easy button is not going to be the solution for, for a lot of people. Um, and Kubernetes is not an easy button, but again, thanks for thanks to people like you, Sebastian, your company that, that helps that, that make it easy. Um, yeah, no, it's just overwhelming. And it really makes me grateful that I'm on the uh, pre-sale side of Dynatrace and no longer on the side that our customers sit on that have to deploy all this stuff. I get to just talk about it and have fun. <laughs> it's so much nicer. <laughs> Anyhow, that was my thoughts about the, the topic. I re really, really appreciate you being on. Um, yeah. Really, really awesome. Yeah. Hey, um, to kind of con conclude today's uh, session, uh, Sebastian, are there, I know in these days where we don't travel anymore, uh, we do a lot of events virtually, or mo everything basically virtually. Uh, I know you are a uh, CNCF ambassador, uh, at least I, I believe so, uh, when reading uh, through your bio and a frequent conference speaker. Uh, yeah, are there any, uh, any places to go where people can find out more about you, what you're doing, where you speak, or how to get in touch with with uh, with folks from your organization or your open source projects. What are the best places to get started with if they want to get in touch with you? Um, yeah, um, I mean, we to really cover this this uh, problem how how to migrate um, uh, existing applications to uh, Kubernetes. Uh, we have. Uh, I think in the next two weeks, uh, a webinar. Um, so if you go to our website, uh, you can find this there, uh, where um, I will talk with one of our engineers uh, about this topic. Um, I'm regular on um, uh, uh, conferences. You can also find me on uh, Twitter, uh, S. Uh, Schiele. Uh, wait. I think uh, I need to check. Yeah, we, I, every time mixing up Twitter and GitHub because <laughs> I have not the same. We will, we will, <laughs> it's vice versa. We will, we will make sure that uh, we will add the link to the S. Schiele. I think it's S. Schiele. Yeah, yeah. I can, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's S. Schiele, uh, exactly, uh, because my Twitter one is uh, Schiele S, uh, uh, so I needed to flip around and I never know which one, <laughs> which one I have where. Yeah. Yeah, and of course you find me also on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, we'll make sure to link to link uh, to all these resources. Um, yeah. With that, um, I think that that it was as uh, just to echo what Brian said. Very insightful. Thanks for uh, answering all these questions. Uh, none of them were scripted. That's why I'm also so happy <laughs> that uh, you just took all of these questions uh, without 
without thinking about it and just like uh, talking about it and then answering them and not kind of backing backing out of it. So that's great. And uh, it seems we found some additional uh, to dos for us uh, in the future, which we will talk about later on once we stop the recording here. But uh, yeah, that's all from me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks for inviting me. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, I hope we can find some ways where we can do some uh, joint open source work. Yeah, that would be awesome. Cool. Right, awesome. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, you can reach us at pure underscore DT uh, or email us at pureperformance at dynatrace.com. And we'll have links to everything Sebastian in the description in the show. So make sure to check those out. Thanks everyone for listening. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.